Thank you, Mehmet. Thank you very much, everybody who's joining online. Let me just put uh, this here so you can see well. Appreciate the kind introduction. And um, so I've been doing most of my life work in, um, for most of my career, I've been doing work in uh, supply chains. And in supply chains, usually we have an idea or we have an understanding that firms affect each other. There's a wide interconnected networks of firms and their decisions end up spilling over across a network, which we call a supply chain. Aussi, um, s'il y a quelqu'un qui veut poser des questions en français, je serais content de la répondre aussi en français. Some petit annonce. And well, but I, as I was saying, um, even if we have an understanding that in, in supply chains, firms affect each other and there is a network. When we think of projects in itself, we often have an idea that projects any, are isolated ventures. And when we model a project or when we do project management work, we often think that um, these projects are pretty much set uh, independent from each other. And the decisions that happen in one project don't affect each other necessarily. And we usually have modeled them as these independent entities. But when you think of it, let's think of a given product, you have a multiple um, participants. We could think of a contractor, an architecture firm, a design agency, and these firms are usually involved, uh, which we call project participants, they're usually involved in other projects. So this firm, this contractor could be doing simultaneous projects, this architecture firm might be doing all the projects at the same time, same with the design agency. And those other projects have other participants collaborating to them. And so what we can see here is we're starting to have a network of projects. Because what we can see is that participants, what they do so strategically is to allocate resources between each project. The contractor has a finite amount of resources, it allocates them across these different projects. So these participants allocate resources that are finite and they strategically do it across these multiple projects. Now, what happens is that because these participants have limited resources, these resources are, um, are finite, their workers, their machinery, their time, they need, sorry, I'm having a little bit of trouble with my, yeah. They have to spread these resources to finish all projects with time. So they are thinking about themselves with the idea of self-interested decisions to allocate resources so that they finish each of their own projects in their own portfolio uh, on, a, on, a, on an appropriate time and without delay. So this contractor wants to spread resources so that project two and project three and project one finish on time. Same with this architecture firm, same with this agency. Now, this resource interdependency will give rise to an interconnected network of projects. And that's what we call in this paper, a project network. Well, yeah. The, the, you know, the type of projects that you are uh, focusing on in this paper are uh, the construction uh, projects or any... Uh... You could extend what we're doing today in this paper to any type of project, but empirically, what I'm going to be looking is, yes, at a... Um, at an actually construction projects. I'm going to be looking at infrastructure projects, but you could extend the same notion and everything here to uh, any type of project. So now we have a hypothesis here. And our hypothesis is the following. Because when projects are susceptible, we know every project, and we know it very well in Montreal, are susceptible to a given disruption, a weather issue, anything that affects that specific project. What we're going to show, and we're going to show it empirically, is that when these localized disruptions happen, when a project ends up suffering a power outage or a flood, something on their own project site, when we think of these as isolated events that only really affect the project, because we've been thinking of projects as isolated entities, we're going to show that when we think of projects as a network, these localized disruptions end up propagating to the network through self-interested resource reallocation decisions from each participant. 
So what we're going to show is that whenever there's a, a disruption in a given project, in a project site, the entire network or, or a big fraction of the network ends up suffering for that isolated disruption because participants start reallocating resources. So the project network ends up becoming an insurance network for that project. So in other words, when if you think if you're building any room here, there's a localized disruption, all of the network of that project ends up paying a little bit for that disruption in terms of delays. So this is the main idea. A project networks inadvertently become an insurance net for disrupted products. And that's what we're going to show empirically. And uh, theoretically, we're going to pose the hypothesis. So let me give you an illustrative example. We have a project network here of three projects. Think, think of three highway construction projects. One in Boston, one in, in New York City, and one in Philadelphia. Um, in this project, there are three participants, uh, three projects, this project, this project, and this project. There are four participants, two excavation companies, two asphalt companies, a very simple network. Um, if there is, suppose there is a disruption here in this project, uh, the Boston project, what we're gonna show is that this ends up spilling over here or sp and then eventually spilling over here. How will this happen? Well, so what, uh, yep. are you showing the projects on the uh, arc? Or on the, the projects are the arc, the Boston project, the New York City project, and the Philadelphia and project. And the nodes are uh, the, the, the participants. participants. Exactly. And the color means they are different parts? Uh, or... And ex you could think of excavation companies as faulting companies. So, yeah. so you can see how they are putting each of them machinery and workers. Now, what happens theoretically is that all projects, when they begin, they expect to finish ahead of time. All projects allocate usually a cushion because they know that they will be experiencing disruptions. Now, if there is a flood in Boston, something that affects the project site, what will happen is if this project now ends up being delayed because that flood ends up affecting or depleting all of its slack time and ends up putting this project in a delay, what this firm will do, as well pay, is that it will move some machinery and resources, at least temporarily, to bring this project in time, not avoid, avoid paying a, a, a penalty. So it will reallocate its lack resources from New York City to Boston. What that means is that now both projects expect to finish just in time, or at least this one has at least less lack time, which means that this project is now more vulnerable to a delay. And so we excavate this partner now ends up being penalized for decisions that were taken in this project. But, but uh, mm -hmm. when the disruption hits, let's say the Boston project, mm -hmm. uh, I think you, you should also think about that some of these resources may be allocated to other parts because they are sitting idle there. Am I correct? You know, if let's say the, the work is disrupted for let's say two weeks, it gives opportunity to asphalt A company and it's excavation A company to reallocate those idle resources. That of course, so this is a very stylized example. There are more things happening, and that's what we're analyzing the empirical model. But overall, because even if these are resources are idle, it's not like they can just move them exactly and that takes training, etc. What we know is that this project is delayed now because of that. So now other projects want to pull resources here to avoid paying a penalty, for example, to the government for delaying that. So that puts this project at a more vulnerable state. Now, because this project is a more vulnerable state, it's more likely to in the future suffer delays if even a small disruption happens. So what will happen if we end up reaching that scenario, this excavation company, We'll move resources from here to here, which puts this other product in Philadelphia a more risk of delay. So this is a systemic um, propagation of uh, a localized disruption across the network. So that's what we're going to show empirically. That annual site disruption could end up causing delays even far in the network. And what we're going to see is that the delays end up paying, end up being paid almost the same across the network. So in other words, just like insurance networks work. 
That's what we're going to show. So how do we do this? We're going to prove this hypothesis by actually conceptualizing this in the model. Then we're going to map, we're going to gather data on almost three, uh, 2 million projects. And we're going to gather data on 5 million delays. Uh, we gather probably the world largest network, every infrastructure project in the US, we map it. And we create that network. And then we show how disruptions actually propagate across the network. That's what we're going to do in this paper. So let me show you uh, quite briefly how we conceptualize uh, theoretically this project network. Then I will show you the empirics, and then I will show you the results. So I'll, let's conceptualize it. I won't give you the entire model in the paper. You'll see a, a more a broader sketch. Um, but we, in this theoretical model, we think of a project as a one-time process with a clear output and a fixed deadline. And um, this output is achieved when multiple participants contribute resources. And we model this in different ways in the paper. Uh, but we assume that there are going to be two types of participants to keep it simple. There are contractors and agencies. Of course, in a real network, there's many other participants. But we are going to think of a network where there are N participants and a network and N agencies. We create a bipartite network because you need the expertise of both parties to achieve an output. And um, this will give rise to a project network, which is a relationship matrix. A P, I, J equals to one if I and J are in a project and are interrelated in a project and zero other ones. So here, just to give you an example, this would be the project network that we have. It, and we have here seven projects in the US. And here we have the contractors and the agencies and we can see how they relate to each other. In this network, there is important to capture the connected components of this graph. And these are important because what we're going to argue, or what we're gonna show is that, well, yeah, as you can see, there's a, the line graph of the network, which is just the inverted way of you see the projects and then you have the, the, um, the participants on the act. So we're gonna look at this uh, line graph of the network. And what we have in this line graph sorry, is this allows to capture the degrees of separation between the projects. Sorry, I'm just telling. The degrees of separations between the projects. So this is going to be the geodesic distance in the line. And what we're going to do with this is we're going to argue that, well, here we have a distance of one or a distance of two between projects, et cetera, et cetera. So this allows us to build this hypothetical project network. And what we're going to generate is an empirical falsifiable hypothesis. And this hypothesis is that if a localized disruption in one project will ripple across the project network, increasing delay likelihood in all network connected projects, in all projects in the connected component of the network. So in other words, if projects are in the same connected component, a localized disruption in a one project, any given project, will make all other projects more likely to experience disruptions and eventual delays in uh, eventual delays in the future. So, if a disruption occurs here in this project in Seattle, what we're going to say is that if there are two identical projects in San Diego, what we can observe, we have this project, and we have uh, project P22, this one. We're going to say that this project in San Diego is more likely to observe a future delay than this one. This is an empirical falsifiable hypothesis that we can actually observe in the data. And, and this is what we're going to try to do to show that there are these interconnections in the network. Any questions so far? Oh, okay. Great. And uh, 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 coming back to the previous slide. Uh, yeah. So this uh, ripple effect mm -hmm. gets, uh, you know, diminishes as uh, the width gets uh, farther and farther. Uh, the, it gets farther and farther, yeah. So as the geodesic distance between two projects increases, then we are likely to observe more delays. Sorry, can I connect this? Is there? Oh. Sure. Exactly. So you're absolutely right. 
as the geodesic distance increases, the the relationship between the projects in the network gets increased. So the the spillover effect decreases. I am still thinking that initially the nearby projects may benefit from the destruction. That's my understanding because they may also shift their idle resources, you know, uh, because they are nearby. But then they start feeling uh, the the disadvantage as it uh, gets. Smaller. This is actually something we haven't tested, but that might actually be. So uh, one way I always think it is about PhD uh, connected projects or like uh, uh, research projects. You are working with me. You're then we're working with other people. Yes. When you have a delay, I may actually go and work yes, exactly. there. Yes, exactly. You may should. You know, focusing on other projects, right? But at the because if I have a slack time, my important thing is I might just be interested in meeting the deadline for this project. So I must actually work. Yeah. It really depends on the nature of the project and the participant. Um so now that actually just showing this doesn't allow us to actually prove what's happening. So what we want to prove is also the mechanism through which this is happening, which is, is it really because they're reallocating resources? How can we observe that in the data? So one of the things that we want to show is that these observed disruptions are actually driven by a reallocation of resources because nothing in the data allows us to see that we don't observe resources. We don't observe time and we actually don't have data about what, how many workers, et cetera, they're putting into projects. So one of the things that we're going to do to actually prove that this is a resource reallocation is by um, actually saying that uh, this idea that when disruptions, when the disruption is bigger than this, like the participants will reallocate resources. So let me think. So the initial reallocation will actually make it more uh, likely for other participants to reallocate these resources. And this will happen as follows. So, so how are we going to actually prove this? So we're going to create a network of 2.6 million infrastructure projects. This is every single project in the US and between 2010 and 2015. All of the infrastructure projects that were done but yeah, where is the source of the data? Great, I'll actually go into this this data sourcing network. So there are actually one hundred and fifty thousand project participants. Think of asphalt uh, companies, uh, construction companies, the architecture firms. We gather every single uh, project. Uh, we also see who are the subcontractors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There are almost fifteen hundred tasks. So you could think from building a university to a highway to re uh, paving a, a street, actually reforesting a park. Every single task, we actually know what is the task that they're performing, um, landscaping, etc. We also have. Also, here's here's actually the 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 um, the source. It's from usaspending.gov. So US spending has this mission to actually show uh, where resources are being spent. So they actually categorize every single project. You can, the data is open. It's a data repository, in fact, that opens multiple data sources. So what we did, actually with uh, around 15 uh, RAs at a time, is for almost a year, we clean, we gather, we merge these four databases, and we ended up with this uh, massive uh, data set. Well, is yep. this a federal level uh, yes. process? And at the state level, uh, they also uh, conduct some state level yes. as well, right? You, you, is, uh, reflecting some data on the... No, and we didn't want... You actually have the 50 states. Almost every 50, if state has something like this, but we didn't want to go and gather the 50 different states. They're much smaller. Okay. Uh, this allows us already to gather a very good idea of the network and prove this. So, so this was actually... Uh, quite a big task, and I want to show you how the project records look like. So here, every project record actually has 260 fields of data. This is just a small summarization of this data. So we have uh, across these 261 fields, what we gathered after cleaning them were the characteristics of the task. So we know, for example, this was a, a hospital 
uh, renovation MRI addition in the Marine Corps. We know a category, so they have a different categorization. As I told you, there are 1,500 categories. The start date and the final date before the project ended, what was the anticipation final date and where was it performed? And so you can see all of these, we actually went through word matching, cleaning, et cetera, just took quite a bit of time. And actually it was for a previous project where in 2016, we have been cleaning these data sets. Then we have characteristics about the contracts. Every contract, how much was it? $60 million, the type of contract, if it's a fixed price, if it was performance-based contract, et cetera. And you have also all of the uh, characteristics you can think about a project, the number of competitors, how many bids were received, if it was a negotiation or was it a, through a bidding process that these arose. And we have different legislative processes for all of this data. We also have the characteristics of every contractor and every agency and every project participant, which is the company. We also know where they're located, how much are they investing, and which is the US uh, agency that is in charge of leasing that project. So for example, this project was done for the, um, for the uh, Department of Defense, more specifically for the Navy. So what we did is we have all of these 200 and uh, 200, uh, sorry, 2 million projects. Uh, we have these characteristics of the projects, but we also gathered the disruption records of the project. So we gather around 5 million disruptions. So we know exactly when was a project disrupted, when did it stop and when did it resume and what was the delay of the project uh, resulting from those disruptions. So these disruptions actually need to be recorded by an inspector general. These are not recorded by the same project participants. Every project has an inspector that goes and actually knows whether uh, there was an issue with the project, what type of delay and what caused it. And we have the data on all of this. So here, as you can see, we know what happened, how much was it delayed and if it caused it. So with this project network, we built a net, uh, we built um, uh, the network the, with these 2.6 million projects uh, and contractors, um, which are 139,000. Government agencies, we have 3,600 uh, government agencies and this project network spans around almost five days, but this network is dynamic, as you can imagine. So you can see how the network changes across the years. Like here it has, so this project network changes, it changes through days, and these nodes change and change and change. The time is a year or? Sorry, five years. Five years, day by day. Sorry, day by day. Day by day. Day day by day. Yeah, so we have uh, we have actually a snapshot of the data every, uh, of 1,800 project networks day by day, how this changes. So what we did for with this is we build a timeline for each project. So for a given project, we know when was it supposed to end. So for example, from day one to 60, we see each disruption when it happened. And then we see, oh, there was a delay, this 20 day delay. And so we are able to actually get for all of these 2 million projects, the exact timeline across all of these. So how are we going to identify our hypothesis? Uh, we're gonna focus not for any, uh, not for data reasons, but for actually simplicity, if we're actually getting clean results, we're gonna focus on weather events. We have every type of disruption that has happened in the network, bureaucratic, delays, uh, there's a strike, whatever happens, we have them, but let's focus on weather. So we're gonna look more specifically localized weather events. events. We're not gonna look at something like Hurricane Katrina that affected thousands of projects, we're gonna look at a specific pro a de delays caused by weather that actually affected one a project or one small county, uh, like a flood affecting a project site caused by a thunderstorm. The reason is that these delays are, exo are exogenous because they're weather delays. We also wanna focus on weather delays because they're universal. All projects to some extent are affected by the weather for different reasons, but everybody's affected by the weather. 
These are objectively measurable events. So we can actually measure and we gather data from the NOAA in the US to see the exact intensity of each event. So we can measure them objectively. The fact that we want to focus on localized events is because these are geographically contained. If I have a very bad weather storm that only happened in Montreal, at least I can isolate it. A supply chain issue, I cannot isolate. It's a generalized event. And again, these weather events, I can cross-reference them with the NOAA data from the US. So this is going to allow me to obtain very clean results. However, we re-estimated the results using other types of, of uh, disruptions. The, the, the results hold quite well. So as you can see, we mapped every different event here, and uh, we have them in uh, different types. You see where floods happen at different times with different intensity. And you can see all of the US map is affected by different uh, types of, of weather events. So now to make the identification once we have actually focused on these delays, we're going to focus on what we call duplicate products. Because we have millions of products in our data set, we are able to identify, and you can call them twins, twin projects. So these are projects which actually, if you look at every single thing, they are identical in every respect. So they have the same uh, task, very similar contractors in the characteristics, although not the same contractors. And they have a uh, you know, same timeline, very similar budget, etc. So we look at very close personal products. So you're talking about matching, right? Am I correct? Yeah, we're doing um, an exact matching in the projects. So of course, exact matching is what we're doing. And what type of attributes do you use for the matching? We look at the characteristics of the contractor and the agency. Characters mean the revenues and so on and so forth. Yeah, the exactly. Budget. The size. We look at the task. It has to be the same task. The budget, it has to be within ten thousand dollars budget. We look at um we look at the agencies. So we gather project P prime and project P double prime, and they are identical in all respects. The only difference we build a synthetic uh um, network of projects that is it's just the, the projects that they are built and they look very similar. The only difference is that one project was disrupted near them and the other one doesn't. So there are three cases. You actually have this. You have the case where two of them were disrupted. So both of them have an adjacent project that was disrupted and when none of them were disrupted, right? So you have case A, the pair of one, case B, the pair of both were disrupted and case C, none of them were disrupted. When you say disrupted uh, simultaneously, like around the same time? Right. Yeah. At, at some point, so I'll show you what happens in one second. So P is connected to a disrupted project, P prime, and P2 is not. What will happen? In this case, we should observe that after the disruption here, more likely to observe a deal. We'll have a second case here. Both got disrupted, but at different times. So what we should be observing is that the disrupt the delays happen in coordination. So actually, we want them to be disrupted at different times because we can see that they, the delays in the adjacent projects at P and P prime were coordinated with the disruption timing here. And if these two identical projects have no adjacent disrupted projects, we should observe that there are no more delays in one than the other. The expected delays are identical. So here we have three uh, ways in which we can do that. So the way we're going to do that is we, we look at the um, at the um, line graph of uh, the projects, and we look at which projects have been disrupted. And so what we do is we eliminate these projects that have been directly disrupted. We eliminate them from the network. So we only end up with projects that have never experienced the disruptions. Then here we generate the matching on, on actually k different characteristics. Here I'm doing an example with two different characteristics. And we do the exact matching. So what we end up gathering is clusters or partitions of identical projects. These are the P, P prime and P double prime that are generated, but we actually have more. So we, we look at those. So that's how that happens. So is that a clear, clarifies it? So now to identify the project, 
uh, twin projects. These were the characteristics that we use. So there you have that is you. And then what we do is we see in each of the periods, we expand this, this uh, line graph across every period. So we have the 1800 different periods and we look at which projects were treated in each period in these partitions. So uh, treated was, I have an adjacent project that was disrupted. And so here you can see that some partitions have projects that were disrupted, some partitions didn't, and some projects have all disrupted and all not disrupted. So now to identify the results, we have to look at partitions where at least one project was disrupted and at least one project was not disrupted because that allows us to generate a treatment group and a control group. Here we only have controls. Here we only have controls. Here we only have three little observations. So here we get rid of all these disruptions and this is the final data that we have. We have these partitions of identical projects with at least one disrupted, at least one non disrupted. So now we have a lot of treatment control pairs. Think of different tests of uh, COVID vaccines where you only give to a small portion of the population. So you think of a lot of uh, exper uh, uh, experimental uh, trials that we managed to build from this data. So now, because all of these partitions have different weights, we need to actually create a different weighting vector. You don't want to weight this and this the same. So we create a weighting vector that is equal to one if the product is treated and it's in an identifiable partition. Uh, a weight of this, I'll go explain you what that means. What that means, so these are all the identified, all the treated observations in identifiable partitions. This is the ratio if you are untreated. This is the ratio of untreated projects in, within the partition to the ratio of untreated projects across the partition. So what this weight allows us to do is to pretty much done a slant our weighting mechanism towards only one cluster of partitions. So that's how we measure all of these untreated partitions or treated product in each partition. And then if you belong to a partition with which you were not identifiable, these partitions where we eliminate the data, we remove them from the so now what we're going to do is we run a matching weighted diff in diff estimation. So it's a diffuse treatment effect with recurrent treatments and it's a synchronous treatment. I won't go over the exact specifics. It's think of a diff in diff estimation where we're trying to get that timeline that I showed you in the three graphs, but it's the same idea. You kind of synchronize the treatment timeline. Yeah. It index and genes, right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So that, that's quite a bit. And what you were going to think is if we had a lot, every partition is one different experiment that we have. So this is actually very, very powerful from an identification technique because we have thousands of little experiments that we can run. So what are the results that we get? When shall you tell the results as you can see they're all significant, but what what are they actually telling us? If we build a synthetic control uh, network that looks identical to this one. So in other words, if we have two identical project networks, but one of them has a disrupted project, the other one not, what these results are telling us is that these green observations can expect 22 to 27% more likely to be disrupted than this green observation. So, uh, is, uh, yeah, more likely to be, sorry, not disrupted, delayed. So you will expect a delay, 22 to 27% more no, likely in this one. In the, blue. 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 in the blue than in the green. In the blue than in the green, sorry. Yeah. yeah. A delay is more than this one because yeah. this one's actually suffered um, a disruption. Now, we went and we actually looked at the uh, two uh, distance, and we found that this is now 7 to 18% more likely to happen. So as you can see, this starts diffusing. And once you, once you go to the third tier, uh, this starts um, diffusing, diffusing, diffusing. We did a high power estimation to actually look third, fourth tier, but we are convolutions, but it's very, very, very demanding computational power. 
Once we go to the third tier of the network, it actually took us over a day to get one estimation, and it's two to four percent more likely. Uh, at a higher level, we think it becomes a significant body. It's very, it's impossible to estimate. Now, how can we know that these are happening because of resource reallocations? We can know that these are happening to resource reallocations, not because resources are observed, because as I told you, resources are not reported. And some resources are actually unobserved. But how can we claim that this is actually happening because they're moving resources? Well. We can look at some samples of projects where first it's feasible versus infeasible to allocate resources. And I'm gonna show you examples. And then we can look at situations where there are incentives versus where there are no incentives to move them. So if we can show, if we can actually show that these spillovers are happening in these subsamples, we can probably actually prove that this is happening because of resource reallocations. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, or even more strong, if we can show that there is no resource reallocations in these scenarios, that even further uh, proves our point. So let's think of this. Let's think of a situation where there is a pavement project that is connected to two reforestation, to, to, to another pavement project or to a reforestation project. Where do you think if there's a delay, resources are going to be reallocated? To this one, because they use the same resources here, they probably don't use a lot. So now, are we really expected to observe this in the data? Well, we did an experiment. We actually re-estimated our results and we saw how is this happening across adjacent projects that are identical in tasks versus for adjacent projects that don't have identical tasks. So in terms of results, as you can see, uh, sorry, let's move forward. As you can see, there are um, in these project networks almost a, what this translates is that the delay is almost one third to half more uh, stronger when the projects actually are taking the same task than when they're not. So it's a much, much stronger effect showing, yes, it is actually a situation of having the same resources incentivizing that. Now, another situation, if the project in San Diego gets disrupted, where do you think is more likely to projects to be resources to be reallocated? To Los Angeles, because it's nearby than in Boston where it's close. So we actually end up looking at these situations and we ended up finding that, yes, when it's easier to reallocate resources because of uh, geographic proximity, we end up seeing much, much farther, much, much stronger results. So this is what we end up finding. The geographic distance is, as a matter of fact, a very strong driver of the results relative to projects uh, that are far away and adjacent. And the last thing that we look is at contractual incentives. We actually observe which contracts and how they're structured. And there are some contracts that have performance-based incentives and where we actually have delay penalties versus others than done. And what you can see is that when there are performance incentives, when I'm actually having a written delay clause, we are observing a, a much more reallocation when I'm penalizing you, because when I'm not penalizing you, why would you have incentives to reallocate? So yes, the actual results are indicating that this is happening because of resource reallocations. So just to summarize, we observe reallocation uh, del delay spillovers when the projects are doing the same task, they're geographically close, or they are having a high penalty versus a low penalty. In so there's a strong evidence that this is actually driven by a re reallocation of resources. So what is the contribution of this paper? When you think about it, we managed to conceptualize a project network. Um, we actually built and shaped an actual map. We have the first map of, of project networks. Um, and we show how disruptions are propagating through this network. So we are the first ones to actually 
give this notion, empirically at least, that project networks affect to each other through reallocations of decisions. And this actually shows us that there's a dark side of operational flexibility and a dark side of actually incentivizing performance across projects. We usually think, oh, give performance incentives to avoid delays, give performance incentives to uh, make sure that your clients are actually incentivized to move. What this ends up causing is this end up causing these huge spillovers that are now affecting parties that have no relationship with the project. Now, this is also, a, no, yes, no, no, no. Okay. The other problem is that uh, too much operational flexibility when we think of building networks that are resilient and that have a lot of connections, that ends up creating, yes, a lot of an ability to reallocate resources, but as we can see, this end up causing a, a very bad uh, uh, spillover of, of resources. Uh, about these uh, implications, uh, did you also uh, consider that, let's say at the very first stage, these companies are deciding about the resource allocation, the initial, at the very initial stage, right? If they kind of consider the implication of those spillovers that will come later, they may actually re-optimize the resource allocation in a much better way to minimize the impact of those uh, spillover effects. Mm -hmm. so, you know, one uh, case is, you know, you do the resource allocation, of, you know, I'm talking about like, uh, solving an optimization problem mm -hmm. where the decision variable is resource allocation uh, without considering those spillover. Mm -hmm. And the other case is doing the same optimization, but with the, the spillover effect. Maybe it can, uh, you, you may see some operational kind of uh, improvement there by taking into account of stress flow rates. This is actually really nice that you mentioned because I'm working right now with a company um, in the UK uh, that manages a lot of of projects, uh, yeah. railway projects. We're actually trying to that uh, we're trying to see how, well. Well, first of all. They actually said, yeah, this is something that is probably happening anecdotally. We have seen evidence. How can we actually what how can we actually think of this in the context of reallocation? What decisions can we make differently? The problem is that firms have a lot of difficulty even just allocating resources. The first time they do it very ad hoc, you try to for them to optimize, they don't. And it's actually something that we've had a, a hard time actually trying to to put the idea that this project is below offers uh, happen. But one uh, you know, case is, let's say you don't change their current uh, uh, total resources. Okay, the, the total resources same, but what you can do is you can do like one way improvement. You know, take one resource from here to another, right? Whether it will actually make their uh, Operations flow better in the you know just a, you know more like a realistic kind of improvement. Uh, it may make things better. Right? Yeah. The the issue is not so much actually the the spillovers happen in, in itself because the spillovers are just a symptom of operational flexibility. When we think of the long chain, etc., we pull resources from other places. It's not that bad. The problem, I think, it comes from an, a penalization mechanism because. The government is penalizing a given project for a delay. But as we can see, projects that are very far away in the network end up being penalized for decisions that made were made at some far away point in the network that just caused this domino effect. So when I'm the government, I'm saying, if you're delayed in this project, I'm going to penalize you X amount. Well, this might not be my fault. This might be the fault of something that happened very far away. So what I'm trying to say is, let's say you, you provide this network, right? If I think about this as an optimization process, I would cause I would try to find a project or a node that's extremely well connected, mm -hmm. and I would put one more resource there, just one additional uh -huh. resource because it's there is high chance that it will be connected to so many other uh, mm -hmm. you know projects, right? So that you know from that point of view, you may actually uh, gain something. You understand my yeah. point? Yeah, no, I, I can see it. Like very simple kind of logistics uh, that may. I can see it. I hadn't thought about that. I have to be. That's a very good point. I think there is something that's the optimization, optimization of the allocation. 
And then what you're doing, which is uh, 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 an exact analysis of the population of the disruptions for the network, so that almost estimate the effect that effective with this image, rather than doing the full analysis because it looks like it's professionally complex, but that means you can if you cannot use it in this control. So maybe one way is that detecting the risky nodes in the graph. Uh, and then having a counterfactual analysis in the sense that you do one change and you try to estimate it uh, from the best to in a, in a, a prescriptive way, like what if I did this? And then you do it with an application. But even detecting the risk nodes is very useful. Yeah. Because maybe you don't know what is that change, but like at least you have 10 changes. Yeah. 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 Oh. Oh, it's a question. No, I, I asked the, the, the audience yes. to use the chat to ask questions. 